So today we have presentations from people that we've been working with for some time, some really gifted lawyers who really get it. And I can tell you that having a gifted lawyer in the space in which you are engaged is, is pretty meaningful. So, uh, so, t so can, you, can you guys roll the video for? So we have a, we have a little introductory video to give you a feeling for, for who, uh, who Kyle and Ellen are, uh, not only for us, but uh, sort of their own worldview of themselves and kind of how they fit into the picture. We have a good, like, vibe together, I think. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm Ellen Grady. I am a member at Cozen O'Connor and I'm a corporate securities intern. I'm Kyle Vostraki. I'm also a member, uh, but I'm in an intellectual property group. And Ellen and I do a lot of work together uh, really with startup companies. Um, it's a passion that we have and that we share together. I like Jefferson for its really focus and dedication on healthcare and life sciences. You just see so many companies that come out of there that say, we have a really critical need in this area of medicine. We have a really critical need in this patient intake. We have a critical area that is a new medical device. So you really can get all sorts of areas of focus that way. But one of the things that we really say is like, let's come up with the right IP protection, the right business plan, the right focus on leveraging what you've done, solving the problem that you're solving and putting a really good product out. That still takes time, effort, energy, and sometimes some luck. But the passion that these folks bring mm -hmm. um, and the dedication is really what's fun about it. Yeah, I mean, that's why we like working with startups and entrepreneurs. It's that energy, that passion that, you know, you feel every single day when you're working with them. But I think working with a Jefferson is so exciting because everybody there is smart, dedicated, coming up with really exciting innovations that not only change the world, which is what entrepreneurs do every day, but change and save lives. And totally. that's like, you know, you got to feel really good about that. So we like to be part of that in a very small way. I don't know, you think they could take the show on the road? This could be the start of something big. Kyle, Ellen, please join me up here and let's get started. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm Ellen Grady. First, I just wanna thank you very much, Jefferson. Thanks everybody for having us. Thanks Dan and Anthony and team for making us look really good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and let me just give you a little introduction for me. Uh, I am Ellen Grady and I am a corporate lawyer. I practice with Cozen O'Connor. Um, I have the pleasure of working with Kyle quite a bit, particularly in the startup and entrepreneurial scene. I've been doing startups for a very long time. Uh, I won't tell you how long, <laughs> but decades. And um, at Cozen, I think we do get it. I, I really sincerely believe that. I think we understand entrepreneurs. We understand that you are about innovation. We understand that you're about commercializing and making successful something that you're really passionate about. And we do want to be a part of that. We know fees are an issue. We get that. We have a very uh, attractive, I would say, offering in our co-pilot program designed to help that, to be a partner with you on that aspect of it. And we know that your thing is whatever your innovation is. And so the way we like to partner with you is you guys focus on the science, you focus on the development of the prototype, if it's a device or the, you know, the molecule, you focus on your clinical trials, and we'll help you understand the legal implications of the many, many, many agreements that you have to put in place. <laughs> totally true. I'm Kyle Vostraki, um, as Ellen said, and I won't rehash this too long so we can get to some of the topics. Um, you know, we really do have a passion for working with startup companies and finding and helping you guys through the early stage, the stuff that you're going, I'm not sure what to do next. Um, that shouldn't be uh, a, a question or an issue in your business. You should be able to come and have counselors um, whether it's us or some other legal counsel or business counsel that's going to help you, you know, uh, navigate those rivers and focus on your product and your development. So um, without further ado, let's, let's pop through some of these. So Ellen put together um, I, what top 10 questions that entrepreneurs are asking corporate lawyers. 
And I think we're, we're gonna kind of splice in some of the IP issues because a lot of times they, they flow together. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll kind of play off one another as we uh, go through some of these issues. So yeah. you wanna start, where That's can I find early stage financing? So I decided that since David Letterman's been off the air for a while now, it was no longer tried to do a top 10 list. So that's what I did. Um, and I sort of put them in order of the questions that entrepreneurs ask me. And I get asked these every single week by different entrepreneurs. But the number one question that I get asked by early stage entrepreneurs and startups is, where can I find early stage money? Because that's the biggest and most critical component. I, I want to keep working on this technology. I want to keep working on commercializing it. So in the Philadelphia area, we're lucky. We have a pretty vibrant uh, investment community, but startup money, early stage, very hard to find. So you need to find an investor that really gets your space. They're focused on life sciences. They're focused on drug development. They're focused on medical devices. And that's gonna bring, that's gonna mean that they're gonna bring a passion to what they do. We have relationships with entrepreneurs, uh, sorry, with um, investment firms. We can introduce you to some. We also, um, in this area, have Ben Franklin Technology Partners, which is a great source of funding. Mm -hmm. If you're, yeah, if you're in the area, they're gonna, they're providing a lot of startup money um, and, and that's a great source as well. Uh, and then a lot of entrepreneurs get money from friends and family. So I have a little medical device company. It's not gonna be little for long. Uh, and so they've been very fortunate. We have an outside investor, but they also have a family that <laughs> is, um, has a child that has a medical condition and this uh, medical device that they're developing will change that child's trajectory and their life and their conditions, their living conditions. And so they're investing as well. They're a wealthy family. They have that wherewithal. So if you're lucky enough to find someone like that, I think that's a great source. So Alan, what does friends and family really mean? Is this truly your friends? Is this your actual family members? Or, or is there, is, what does that really mean in the industry? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, years ago, friends and family really meant friends and family. You knew that person very personally. Now it doesn't mean that so much. It kind of means your extended circle. And one of the things we talk about with uh, startups and entrepreneurs when they're raising money, you have to think about securities laws, mm -hmm. which is a very extensive overlay for raising funds for any company. And in doing so, um, we come across this concept that you can't be engaged in a public offering. What does that mean? It used to be you couldn't put anything out there on the internet. But that term has generally come to be much more broadly interpreted. And so what we're talking about is folks in a small circle that you have some relationship sure. with. Maybe it's you know somebody and they know somebody and that puts you together and they come in and start looking at your, you and your business and what you're doing. So it's a, it's a more extensive circle than it used to be. So good question. Yeah, so let me, I'm gonna pop a couple slides through yeah. here. So, you know, people always say, okay, we've got this friends and family funding round, or we've got a first angel investor. I think that I needed two hundred fifty thousand dollars. What am I using that money for, right? And so one of the one of the big issues, especially let's 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 assume that we're in the healthcare uh, space. You know, people always say, Kyle, I, I gotta have a patent. Like that's it's critical to my business. And some people will say, yes, that's true. Um, and other people will say, well, not necessarily. Let's let's be careful on how you want to spend those early dollars. So the, you know, the question is, do I need a patent to sell my product? And, and I'm gonna say the answer is maybe, okay? So if you're in healthcare IT and you're making a software product or you're making an app, something that is solving an issue that doesn't necessarily have a hard device, you can have, um, you really have an option. Do you wanna have a patent on this? Um, or do you wanna try to use some other form of intellectual property protection? In my opinion, you always wanna have some sort of asset, right? I'm calling intellectual property generally an asset. And so some of this initial seed and funding money is used to help you spend those legal dollars probably necessary to do that funding. Um, so if you had a, 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 an IT solution, a software solution, um, patents are somewhat difficult to get in that space. I'm not saying that people aren't filing, they certainly are. Um, but you wanna have a clear reason why you're making that filing or a clear reason why you're not making that filing. So I had a discussion just the other day with someone and I said, well, if you file, 
you basically have to tell the entire world how your software works, right? These are all the intermediate steps that I'm doing. This is how it's giving a solution. And that patent's not gonna issue for three or four or more years. And what's gonna happen to your software between now and that three or four years later? Are you gonna be using that same thing or is it gonna have been modified enough that you might say, you know what, that software's obsolete, potentially? That patent might not be a good solution there because the time to get you into that patent is gonna be sufficient. And again, we're still gonna face the issue in the patent world um, that you may not get that patent because it may be um, a business method that is, is not um, protectable by the patent rights. If we have a medical device though, I, I often say, yeah, you gotta have a patent, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna chime in. You know, With respect to software, I spent a couple years at a venture capital firm and I will tell you what we worried about a lot at the venture capital firm if you were filing a patent on software is publicizing that software because in the software world, things move so quickly. And an add-on, a slight improvement to code changes code. So sometimes we really actually as an outside investor preferred that you didn't file a patent on that but, but made sure that you had safeguarded well the source code and other sort of intellectual property inherent in that software. Right, so following up that solution is tell your VCs, if you're going out to a VC and you say we're not filing a patent, have the story down. Yeah. VC, we're not filing a patent here because one, it's, it's a cost. Yeah. Two, I don't want to tell everybody what we're doing. Three, we've protected this in another, another vehicle, yeah. right? We have a trademark, we have a copyright under our source code. Really critical, be confident in that story. Tell your VC why you did it, why you made that solution, and, and one of the good ones is I'm not spending 20 plus thousand dollars on a patent that may not be granted and that I'm giving away my business, so. And just as an aside, Kyle and I have told this um, to entrepreneurs time and time again, uh, you gotta have a story. So you're going out and you're raising money. I don't care if it's an angel investor, I don't care if it's a VC fund, I don't care if it's friends and family, you have to have your story down and if you're going to institutional investors, you probably need to be able to tell that story in about, what do we usually tell people, 10 slides? You got about 10 slides and maybe about 10 minutes, you know? So you gotta, it's gotta be a quick story. You gotta get people's attention quickly and the, yeah. the intellectual property protection is a big part of it because that is an asset, which for you guys translates into valuation, higher valuation. I mean, I, I do tell people, look at Shark Tank. Um, it's, it's somewhat representative. They walk up there, they have a very clear, polished story that they're telling. I know when I've gone to competitions and I'm judging people and I'm saying which one of these businesses is gonna work. The polish is important because I'm often as a VC person, uh, uh, you know, an, uh, someone that's investing in these companies, I'm investing in the individual. Uh, yes, the idea really matters, but I want someone that can walk up there with, and exudes confidence and is telling me, Kyle, you need this product. This is where it is going. That confidence, that story is really critical. So. Yep. And I represent a medical device company right now. We're doing a funding round. We have an outside investor. And uh, that outside investor has said to me many different conversations, many different ways. I know you've got all these folks involved with your company. I understand the product you're developing. We're betting on this guy. He's our guy. Right. He is the guy. Right. That's, that's who we wanna make sure is fully engaged with this business and has appropriate incentives in place to make this business successful. All right, so Alan, I, 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 I've got a great idea. I don't know where to even start. I, someone told me I need to get a company. What do I do? Help me. Yeah. So that's my second question that I get every single week. Limited liability company or corporation? And of course, being a lawyer, my answer is it depends, because that's what we always answer. <laughs> uh, so LLCs are great investment vehicles if you're not taking outside money, right? They're very tax efficient. There's not two layers of tax. If we have a corporation as our separate entity, that's separately taxable. And when your company gets really big and it's making a lot of profits, before you get your money, they're gonna have to pay tax on that profit and then dividend it out to you, and then you have to pay tax on the dividend. A limited liability company is either taxed as a disregarded entity, we just pretend it doesn't exist, no tax at all at the entity level, or as a pass-through entity if it's a partnership. Again, we just pretend it doesn't exist. So there's an efficiency there that really can be valuable. I mean, it translates into real cash. Now, President Trump gave us a, a little bit of a 
present at the end of 2017. He lowered the corporate income tax rate. That's huge. You know, the highest income tax rate used to be about 35% for corporations, and now it's going to be 21%. That's a big change and a big difference, and it really makes the equation a little bit narrower, if you will, the difference between the two. Um, if you are a company that's anticipating taking outside investment from something like a venture capital fund, on the East Coast, in the city of Philadelphia, most of the time, other than for real estate, which is completely different, most of the time, VC funds will only invest in a C corporation, a corporation taxable uh, under the tax code as a C corporation, not an S corp. So. How easy it is uh, if I start as an LLC to move to a C corp if I want to get investment? Um, so it's very easy to move from an LLC to a corporation. That's not problematic, really. Um, we have what we call conversion statutes now. It is much harder to go from a corporation to an LLC. You basically have to pay tax on whatever is inherent in the corporation before you can convert it to an LLC. So we can convert from an LLC to a corporation. But there's a cost and a time component. Right. So when you're a startup, every dollar counts. So if you're going to raise money in the next six months, and you're going to get institutional money, don't start as a corporation. Uh, don't start as an LLC, start as a corporation. That would be my advice anyway. And, and Ellen, you can help us get those simple documents straightforward. I need it. There's formality requirements, though, for a corporation. So what kind of stuff do I need to make sure I'm doing? Yeah, there's, both, there's formality requirements both for a corporation and an LLC. A lot of times we work with LLCs that have already been set up, and those formalities haven't really been observed. But there are formalities for an LLC, too. Um, for corporations, we're going to have articles of incorporation. We're going to have bylaws. We're going to have a board of directors. We're going to have officers. LLCs, you may not have all of that, but you will at least have an operating agreement, and you will have somebody authorized to act on behalf of the entity. It's still a separate and distinct entity. So. Great. Yep. So one of the questions that comes up as I pop back to this, um, I, I'm going to jump to something I think that's more natural here. So who owns this IP, right? So we found a company. Uh, I'm the inventor, and I, I say, well, what do I do with this thing? The company owns the IP, but how do we do that? Assignments, all right? So this is one of the key documents that you've got to have early on in your company, and you just got to be aware of. Let's say that um, you as the founder are working with two outside consultants, and they may be inventors. Um, have the paperwork that says, yes, I, John Smith, and I, Mary Smith, assign my rights to company. If you don't have that paper from day one, it's a problem. What happens five years later when the company is worth $100 billion? Yeah. Um, that's a problem that we all want to have happen. Um, John and Mary Smith are going to say, I need 25% I need of that. There's no way I'm going to sign my rights over to that, com uh, to that company without getting a lump sum. Um, that's not what the parties had intended from the beginning. In fact, it was probably that you paid them a small amount of, of money to help do something. Um, this actually frequently comes up in a trademark and a copyright issue. So maybe we have someone that does a website for us or does some source code development for us um, that is an outside consultant. And it doesn't, for whatever reason, fall under some certain rules that are related to those trademark and copyrights. And so a couple years later, we're selling the company and someone's in diligence and says, do you own all those things? Like, I don't, I'm missing the paperwork. Yeah. Um, huge problem. So focus on those documents. The documents really do matter. And you know, again, these are routine documents to get yeah, quick story on that. I did an acquisition last fall, a private equity, outside investor coming in, taking a 40% stake in a software-based company. And uh, so they're paying $55 million for a 40% equity stake. And this company did not have in place all the assignments. This was on some improvements that had been made to the software. And they said, oh, we're not really using that piece. It doesn't really matter. No. We had to go back and get everyone who was involved in the development of that software to sign over an assignment. And we had to pay them, because there needs to be some consideration, because they're assigning something that they own legally. Um, so we did that, and we were fortunate, because everyone was around and we could, we could get that done. But how much easier, if you had just called us up, you know, I've got some uh, colleagues here. We've got these documents pretty much, frankly, ready to go, call us up, we'll send you a form document, and you will know that every single consultant who works with your business has to sign this or you're not yeah. going to work with them. And most do readily. Yeah, agreed. So uh, let's jump to this question, okay. 
we formed our company, we got this asset, when do I file, right? I have a little bit of money in that I got from a friend and family, but you know, money's tight, and I, you, know, you, you just told me it's gonna cost me X dollars to get this patent filed, when do I file? So patents are funny in this, that the moment you disclose them, you really have risked your opportunity to have worldwide coverage. Um, in, the, in, in the United States, um, we have a one year grace period that gives you a little bit of space to say, okay, you disclosed it, but you can still file one year um, within the, the, the time that you made that disclosure. Internationally, that's not the case. And so this is a real problem when we have a medical device, a drug, um, et cetera, et cetera, where uh, the market is Europe, right? That, uh, or Japan, or China, or Australia. So an issue comes in is, well, I've already told someone about this, or I'm already trying to sell it. Have I lost my opportunity? And the answer sometimes is yes. So before we make those first sales, before we go out and disclose this to people without a non-disclosure agreement, we really need to consider, okay, what is our strategy? And so I think that's one of the first things that we do when we bring in new teams, is we say, okay, what do you guys have already, and what have you done? And we really try to put together a, a business plan, maybe is, isn't exactly the right word, but a timeline strategy of what are you gonna do over the next six months, right? What is your next step, and when are you gonna utilize some of the resources that you have to make sure that this intellectual property that we're gonna rely upon to go raise our next round is protected in the markets that we need to go into. I wanna pause a moment on non-disclosure, confidentiality non-disclosure agreement, another critical document you have to have in place. So I represent a medical device company right now. They're using an outside company to help them develop the right. prototype. Before we disclosed anything to them, we got them to sign an NDA. And again, it's a relatively standard document. We have forms in our files that are easily um, made to conform to whatever your unique circumstances are, and then you just get everybody to sign it before they uh, are brought under the tent, if you will. And sometimes that can be two different uh, agreements. If I'm just yeah. walking over yeah. and giving them knowledge, I'm just discussing my, my concept, that's one thing. If I'm bringing prototypes, or I'm actually sending them out a molecule that I've created in a lab or a prototype that they're doing some testing on, I might do a material transfer or a transfer agreement that says, yes, I've given you some of this. Again, we have those documents in place to make sure that everybody understands, okay, who owns what? Yeah. And a big thing on that is who owns the intellectual property rights that are generated through whatever's happening. If I'm paying you uh, to do this work or we have a partnership on it, I want that intellectual property come back to the company, right? Those are assets yeah. that the company is creating. Yeah. So missing that NDA is two issues. I may have disclosed, and two, that person may say, I own that personally, yeah. not the company. Real problem. I also just wanted to mention, because we're in a room of scientists and folks who are perhaps involved in creating more than one company, more than one innovation, if you will. And we have this happen all the time as well. Um, I find it particularly in the medical field because physicians are really involved in some different, different projects. So that we can deal with that too. So let's say you've got two different projects. You need to assign the intellectual property related to one project to that company. And if it relates to a different company or a different project, as long as they're not in competition for one another, in my experience, your outside investors aren't going to care. So just make sure that you're disclosing those things to your attorneys and we can draft carefully so that you're fully protected in both companies and, and can be free to develop both of those innovations in whatever form you want to do so. All right, Ellen, this okay. is exciting. How much is my company worth? I've filed <laughs> these patents, oh. I've got some of this, right? I've got, I've got some dollars in. Okay, this maybe should be the number one <laughs> question, right? Most entrepreneurs, you know, think that their company is worth, I don't know, somewhere between a million and $10 million. It's never less than a million in my experience. Most outside venture capital financing folks think that your company is without value. So <laughs> there's a disconnect there somewhere. <laughs> um, with early stage startup companies, it's very difficult to say what the value of the company is. So probably the value of the company is what an outside investor is willing to fund you on that basis of. Right. Uh, so what we do a lot of times with early stage companies is we kind of kick it down the road a little bit. So instead of issuing an equity instrument, 
common stock or more likely preferred stock initially. What we like to do, what investors like to do, is issue what we call a convertible note. So it's a note, you're signing a note, it says I owe you this much money, but nobody ever expects that you're gonna repay that note. The note has a conversion feature, and what they really are expecting is that if the company's successful, they're gonna convert that note into equity in your next round of financing. How are they gonna convert it? Well, we don't know what the value of the company is gonna be when you do your next round of financing, but we set a cap. Okay, we don't know what the value of your company is today, but it's probably not worth more than two million, four million, five million, whatever it is. And that cap then becomes the cap that they convert at. It can't be more than that. Even if in the next round the value of your company is 20 million, today we all agree it's not worth more than two million, so you'll convert at that two million dollar level. It, it gives everybody a little bit of flexibility on valuation at a time when it's pretty hard to set. So just wanted to mention that too. Yeah, but it's an important step. That first investor should get a little bit more return on their revenue than the later investor. Yeah, they're taking a lot more risk. Yeah. A yeah. lot more risk. The early stage investors obviously are partnering with you right from the beginning. The other thing I'll say is um, a lot of times early stage investors are with you all the way through. They might not be able to fund you at every stage mm -hmm. of development, particularly if it's like a drug company, which takes a lot to get to commercialization in terms of funding. But once they've invested with you, they really want to see you be successful. And so they're going to want to try to keep investing to the extent they have the funds to do so. so that's right. a good partner. I think this is a perfect segue is, do I want to run this company and who do I want on my board? Yeah. To me, those questions become similar yeah. to talking about my early investors. Do I want them on my board? Yeah. How do I fit those people in? Owen? So early investors all, in my experience, most early stage investors tend to have their own profile and they vary quite a bit. A lot of early investors want one seat on your board. They want to sit at the table with you. They want to see how you're managing the company. They want to know what's going on. Some early stage investors don't. Go off, do your thing, come to us if you need us. We want rights to really big decisions. You can't sell the company without coming to us, right? But right. hey, if you're choosing to move your prototype from company X to company Y, we don't need to know about that. That's every day, you guys are running that. Um, so it really depends. With my physicians, I do have some physicians that end up being the CEO of the company. Hey, physicians are smart. They certainly know how to uh, manage projects and, and they can definitely be CEOs. I have other physicians that are very much into the research, that are very much into the prototype, mm -hmm. the development, the innovation, and they don't want to run the company. And so sometimes they become chief medical officer or sometimes they even take a different role, just a little bit different than that. So it can go any way, it can go different ways, but I, it's what's best for the company, what's best for the company. How do I find, I, I, I'm a medical uh, doctor and I love doing the research, I wanna be a chief scientific officer. How do I go find a CEO that is gonna fit my company and my profile? Am I gonna give away a lot of my company to do that? How do I pay this person, right? These are, uh, we just started. Right, you, you have no money typically to pay your person and typically, so a lot of times if you have a source of funding, they've got a stable, if you will, of folks who that's what they do. They come in and they act as CEO and they help you move that company along to the next stage of development. So they'll help you find a good CEO. Obviously personalities are gonna count, so you're gonna wanna have some say in that process as well. Um, what do you pay them? Well, typically there's not a lot of cash Hopefully your CEO doesn't need to get a good salary because you know $200,000 salaries just don't happen very often at startups. There's just not the cash for that to occur. So they're gonna want equity. Everybody says to me, what, how much equity should I give them? Again, being a lawyer, it depends. But the real answer is give them as little equity as you can give them. I mean, right? <laughs> it's your company. You want to give them as little equity as you can give them. And never guarantee them a percentage ownership interest, right? Say, okay, you know, right now I'm going to give you X shares. And right now that equates to Y percent of the company. But we're taking in more financing. You're going to be diluted. I'm diluted. You're diluted. Everybody's getting diluted. Right, because if I promise someone a percent, then I do two more rounds and all of a sudden that percent is more than I own. Yeah. That's a problem. 
And, and sometimes, too, with that type of protection, what we see is for folks here at Jefferson, a lot of times the patents are held by the university because you've developed that innovation, if you will, while you're working full time for the university, and then it's licensed to the company. So that's a different situation as well. And a lot of times we see that in that license agreement, universities want some anti-dilution protection. So if everybody gets anti-dilution protection, that squeezes you, you know? And as we said at the outset, investors want to know that you're fully engaged with this company, fully incented to make this successful. And if that's the case, you need to have enough skin in the game, because you're not probably not taking much of a salary either, that you, you know, keep working very hard for it. All right, before we go on to some other points that we have on slides, questions. Let's just open it up and see. Go ahead. So when you oh. hire a CEO, Hold on. Then since we don't know how good the CEO is going to be on your project, can we tell him it will be performance based? Yes, yes. Actually, that's a great concept. So typically what I suggest to my entrepreneurs is when you hire a CEO, give them restricted stock. Restricted stock vests upon meeting certain conditions. They can be performance-based conditions. It can just be time, right? You can, you can fire a CEO at any time. Most startups don't pay severance if they fire a CEO. Uh, most startups don't have employment agreements or things that say you can only terminate somebody for cause. So you can fire them, and if, if it's time-based, if they're fired, their stock doesn't vest. Um, for restricted stock, what do I typically see? Three to five years vesting. So you vest over three to five years, and most frequently right now I see it about four years with what we call one-year cliff vesting. So nothing vests for a year. You gotta be there for at least a year before anything vests. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good testing period to see if they're gonna work out and if you think they're the right guy they or gonna, girl. Are they gonna sign on though if I don't give them anything up front? I gotta give them something, don't I? Uh, you know, it really varies from person to person. It really varies from person to person. It's very much an, a negotiation. So, but the goal is I want to find someone that's going to fit with my company, help me grow for the next year, two, five years, yep. and give them some skin in the game. They want to, they want to be profitable yep. too. Right? Sometimes, too, with an outside investor, you'll find that the outside investor will kick in something so that that CEO can either take a little bit of equity, a little bit of cash, something so that it's not all coming out of the skin of the entrepreneur, if you will. Good question, yep. though. Really good question. Oh, yeah. Super quick, I just wanted to Please. point out that the um, our innovation pillar uh, can also help with finding CEOs, sourcing CEOs. Great. So um, please do feel free to come talk to uh, me. I'm the director of licensing, and um, I'm happy to do speed dating. I have a huge Rolodex of people that have float through projects and you know might be finishing up a project and looking sure. for a new thing that fits in the wheelhouse. Yeah, and, and I also have observed that the CEO having skin in the game is usually a really good sign to investors, outside investors. When you've got a qualified CEO with a good background in the area and they come in on risk, that's just a little bit more buy-in. Yeah. We agree. And if we have an investor already, we usually vet that CEO with the investor first. You like this person, you know, meet them, greet them, make sure everybody's good with it. Hi. Um, Hi. I hear very often that the investor community in Philly is, I hear words like conservative, or risk averse, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound good when you're an entrepreneur with a really, you know, futuristic medical innovation, for example. Um, can you further address how, uh, good ways for innovators to help to to improve their odds? Uh, yeah, that's uh, and you're right. Uh, I think we've all heard similar stories. Um, one, have great data, show promise, right? Take it away from me looking at the stars down here. We can still tell a story, and I think that's always one of the key things. It's a moment that I can take this out from just some shooting from the stars to this is real, guys. And, and I think fine tuning and focusing that story is really, that's part of your job as the entrepreneur, as the inventor, is to really wrap this together into a business plan that's showing I'm not just shooting for the stars here. I, of course, I am, because this company is going to be worth many, many billions of dollars in the future. But today, tomorrow, we have real progress. What do you think, Alan? Yeah. So I think in Philadelphia, when people say that the investor community is conservative, what they mean is that valuation is low. <laughs> I, and, and I think East Coast valuations tend to be lower than West Coast valuations. 
Um, that's what I see anyway. And, and when we, when I was at a venture capital firm and we were competing against the West Coast, we couldn't win any. Uh, we couldn't win any companies we were wooing because the West Coast values were just much, much higher. There's a lot of free-flowing cash out there, and people are willing. I do think people are more willing to take risks out in Silicon Valley than they are here. So how do I get in front of Silicon Valley investors? Again, I, I mean, I think your comment about data is 100% the right thing. A lot of times we see pilots and test programs at universities like medical college, like a Jefferson, a Penn, a CHOP, uh, you know, the, the, to get in there and be able to do a, a pilot program, a test program, even if you're not getting paid to validate your product or your innovation, I think that's a great way to do it. Good. Anybody else? Uh, so when you're creating these documents, uh, are there also benchmarks for like time periods as far as um, meeting what your investors or your CEO expects of you as the entrepreneur? Um, and how's like that factor into all of these agreements? Good. Yeah, so you know, one thing I'm seeing over the past few years, whenever you're working in this area, things change over time. So one of the things that I'm seeing right now is tranching. So you have an investor, they're willing to commit <laughs> $2 million to your venture, but they're giving it to you a little at a time. So the first half a million is X, the next million is, okay, when we see a working prototype, you're gonna get the next million, and the next million is whatever. So they're setting up milestones. In my experience, it's usually geared to your business plan. They're gonna want you to have a business plan, they're gonna want you to be able to articulate it. Uh, it will change over time, everybody's business plan changes. It, it you know, morphs, it, it zigs, it zags, and that's okay. Um, sometimes we see performance-based vesting in for, for founders too. So I, I'm, I represent a company right now, they ha all the founders have initial stock issuances. An outside investor said, we want them to even have more equity in the company, so everybody's getting an additional restricted stock award that vests over the next four years, but that could just as easily be performance-based vesting. The issue with performance-based vesting for lawyers, we want a lot of clarity around whether that condition has been met. So you say a working prototype. Well, what a working prototype means to you might be different than what a working prototype yeah. means to the investor, right? What do you see, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, the working prototype is really, uh, it's a hanging chat in some ways, right? Back to our uh, election times. I, I, I could walk out and say that anything is a working prototype. I mean, yeah. you could roll a brick down the street and say, that's a wheel. Um, so I have, um, I have seen many things that are non-functional that the inventors are saying, this is like, this is the next thing. And I'm going, show me the data. I, I, I'm a really data-driven person. And maybe that's because I'm a scientist by nature. Um, and as a patent lawyer, I love putting good data into an application that's saying, look at the difference, right? We've got X and Y and Z, and it's just knocking this thing out, and it's, it's doing these things. To me, that's really powerful evidence. The VCs are smart guys and gals too, right? I can walk up to them, and, and I'm gonna say, this is the key data and information I'm, I'm, I'm showing you, and this is why it matters. A lot of times, the VCs you're going to find, especially if you're in this medical field, are scientists or were scientists. You have doctors that are, for, are uh, former doctors that are VCs. You have former patent lawyers that are yeah, VCs. Absolutely. So you have a lot of people that have a huge amount of knowledge in that space. So you may get really detailed questions about your specific thing. If you're going to a really big VC as well, they may have a stable of scientific advisors even. Absolutely. Uh, so absolutely. don't be, you know, especially when you're later on in a stage. A and B funding, around, especially, you're gonna have a lot of detailed questions, and they're really gonna break it down. In fact, I, we've certainly been on the side, I know Ellen and I both have been, where we're representing the VC who's going to do the investment, do and they are asking, you guys gotta help me walk through this and, and, and understand what's happening here, making sure that this is real. Um, so that's something we do pretty frequently, I yeah. would say, so. Yeah, I just wanted to mention too, kind of tangential, sure. but, um, so the other thing we talk about sometimes with startups is this concept of a board of advisors. That can be a way that, particularly for younger entrepreneurs and, and 
you know, literally in our community, because we've got a really vibrant startup community, some of my companies, they're undergrads. I'm not kidding you. The founders are undergrads. So, and they're really smart. I mean, it's amazing what they're doing. But sometimes to sort of show a, I, investors a little more uh, gravitas or gray hair, whatever you want to call it, we will set up a board of advisors. And the advisory board, a lot of times, they don't even really meet formally as a group, but they're available to you when you have questions and things like that. And they'll typically get a small equity award to compensate them for doing that. So that's a way you can sort of add to your stable of knowledge without adding significantly to your costs. I also think that they're really, really helpful for your company. Um, some of these folks have been through companies before. Yeah. They have been exactly in your position as an inventor. They've been exactly in your position now as a CEO or as someone that is going from friends and family to uh, A stage to B stage funding to, oh my gosh, someone made an offer. Um, what do we do? Having those people in your Rolodex to be able to call up very quickly and say, I know you have skin in the game here as well because I gave you a small option share. What do we do here? Uh, you know, nobody wants to reinvent the wheel. They Find also people. they also know customers, yeah. and yep. they know folks who can pilot your you know device or your software or test it in the in a hospital setting if it's a medical device. Yeah, I, I that's a really good point. And I can't reiterate that enough. When I want to get a valuation and I want to show that this isn't just uh, snake oil. How do I do that? I find a customer, I find a test pilot. Going to your advisors, going to your angel, going to your VC and saying, hey guys, we need an introduction to so-and-so to really move this thing forward. Critical in my mind to be able to prove your principle. Yeah. So. so we have a couple more questions and I just want to point out to the folks that are streaming that uh, you, can, you can tweet questions to us at Jeff Innovation and you can also tweet observations about some of the things that you're hearing and seeing today. So you have another question. Uh, just as a follow-up, so you mentioned earlier that say if you're a physician here at uh, Jefferson and you've created something that Jefferson has ownership of in one way or form, if that's unrelated to your work as a physician, um, because you're fully employed by Jefferson, do they still have a claim to ownership? So it, it really depends on what Jefferson's policies say. You need to look, you probably, if you're faculty, you probably have a faculty handbook. If you're an employee, you probably have an employee handbook. There's certainly policies and procedures that Jefferson has that speak to that. Typically, if you have used any sort of facilities of the university, they own it. So even if you came in on Saturday but you used a Jefferson computer, they probably have some claim to it. If you used, if you have a lab and you used your lab, even if it's unrelated to what you're doing at Jefferson, even if you did it in your own time, they probably have a claim to it. But that's something you want to figure out very early on. And I will also say this, we have been very successful we're in a new environment with universities. They want to commercialize these technologies. So if you have a good plan for developing a commercial strategy for a device or a product that you've developed, they're probably going to partner with you somehow to help you get off the ground. Either, you know, the first step is usually an option for a license. Second step is usually a license. By the way, folks, we like worldwide irrevocable <laughs> licenses, things that are going to stay, staying power. Um, but the universities usually, in my experience, very much, it's a win-win situation if you take off with that product. Yeah, I'll, I'll plug the innovation pillar here. Um, if you've got a great I I invention, a great concept, send a disclosure, talk to folks, get some closure on that. Uh, what Ellen said is, is absolutely right. Yeah. You're not going to be able to go to an investor and say, well, I was at Jefferson at the time, but I own this all to myself. Yeah. I, I, people here in the area are going to say, red flag. Um, you're not going to have that person be an investor because you've already gone to them with something that's probably not totally accurate. Um, that's not a good way to start that relationship. So yeah. if, if, if that's the time when you created this thing, if you're going to put up things that are clear red flags, I, uh, as an investor, I'm running, right? There's no way I'm going to get involved with something that five years down the road is going to be a very expensive lawsuit about yeah. who owns what if you had something that was very successful. Um, we've certainly been involved with um, issues where someone comes in later and says, what about me? I own this. Um, yeah. There's a famous um, movie even made about Facebook, about these exact issues, right? About who right. owns what. So um, be careful yeah. about who 
uh, about what you're saying and when you're saying things. Um, it is so much easier to deal with those things right then and there. Don't, yeah. don't let those things fester. They just turn messy. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to say something? Yeah, since things took the turn towards um, the university ownership, I will add that if you have a question, come ask us. I mean, we're not grabby. We don't want to own things that aren't under the policy, and it, it, it's pretty clear. So, so um, we're more than happy to talk to you. And then if it is yours and you go on and you get an investor, you can say, oh, the university was very clear that I own this and I have an email. Yeah. And, and then you're absolved of that yeah. entire issue. So it's one of those that's easier to run at it than and, away and from I, it. And I will say, Early. Right. In my experience, that time, that's usually really handled well here at Jefferson. Um, you know, there are some other, uh, look, we, all have, we have clients that are in other spaces, yeah. and people don't get that letter or they don't have clarity, or it's a, well, we got clarity for this, but I zigged did I zagged a lot, and I still was doing this at my lab, do I still own it? And I'm going, you, you just, you gotta, you gotta get some clarity, you gotta have told the, you know, whoever, your university or college or whatever it was about this issue, so you can get that sign off, get something down in writing so that we have clarity. Hand it off to your VC when they are gonna ask that question, because I guarantee I will be asking that question and uh, I'm not gonna invest until I know that you own those assets. No way, right. not gonna happen. So the, other, the other thing related to that I'll tell you is that if it's a really great innovation, it's only gonna increase in value. So it's much better at the outset to get that clarity. Once it's worth a lot of money, people fight a lot harder over it. Right now it might not be clear how much value is there. So actually, I just added that on because of the bend things took right before I got the microphone. But my original statement was going to be that, Kyle, I feel like it would be helpful if sure. you guys don't work it in or if you guys feel up to it. The difference between a prior art search and due diligence and when, when they're appropriate. Sure. Um, so a prior art search. Um, so there's, I'm even going to break that down further. You want to tell what people what prior art means? Yeah, prior art. So yeah, that's a good start. Prior art as I get stuck in the clouds. Uh, prior art is something that is already published before you are coming up with this idea or this concept. So let's say that I've invented a mousetrap um, today and um, the question is, is there any prior art out there about a mousetrap? The answer is obviously yes. Mousetraps exist, people have published about mousetraps, I know that's prior art. Um, my next example is, I have a new compound X and nobody has ever talked about it and I'm gonna file an app a patent for it and then six months later someone publishes something on that exact same molecule. The question is, is that prior art? No, right? I filed first, I invented that. Someone may have in parallel invented that on their own, but it is separate. So the question, uh, I think Heather's question is good. What is prior art? What's a prior art search? And sort of what is necessary? There's, I, I still break those down a little bit. So there's something called more like a freedom to operate, and there's something called a prior art search or a patentability search maybe is a good way to differentiate. If I'm doing a patentability search, I'm saying I have this really good idea, is there prior art out there that might preclude me from getting a patent? Um, most of the time, we can do these relatively easily. Um, uh, less than, less than $5,000 for sure, where you're gonna be able to really get a general understanding of what out, what's out there. You're gonna be able to make some decisions about, is this an investment worth taking? A patentability search, uh, 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 or excuse me, a freedom operate on the other hand, is much more of, I've got a product. Here's my final product. It's a gadget gizmo with A, B, and C components. That may have not been what I conceived of like a year or two ago. Now I'm really saying this is, I'm, I wanna go to market with this thing. It, it, can I go to market with that? That can change over that period. And so sometimes we do that a little later in the, the process or, or at that point where we're really saying, okay, we're going file. This is gonna be our commercial product. We do that final search. So, but uh, how that fits in with diligence. Helen, what do you wanna talk about diligence? Well, <coughs> you know, what I find with diligence is that at the time you're getting outside investment money, not so much with friends and family, but any uh, professional investor or investment company, they're gonna diligence the heck out of your company. So they're gonna want to have things, as Kyle would say, locked down. Um, and it's not just your patentability or your prior art, it's you know, all the things we've talked about, your confidentiality agreements, your assignment of invention agreements, your stock awards, all of that has to have been done well and done the right way. And it's always cheaper for us to do it the right way at the outset than it is to fix it after the fact, just the reality of it, folks, so we, that's true. we frequently get to a diligence point where someone wants to raise funds and they say, okay, here's everything. It's in a giant folder with zero organization and zero sorting. So the time- We get that a lot, actually. 
is invested to do that is is significant. Um, if you start a company and you come up with a plan right from the beginning and you really say, hey, all of my non-disclosure agreements go here, everything about the IP that I own is in here, everything about product one is in here, about product two is in here, product three is in another box, that's helpful. When we have to do a diligence drop to a VC firm, we can literally set them up with a, um, a VPN or with a, a, a Dropbox, a data box, and I can really cleanly put those boxes in there and they're gonna have everything. I'm gonna have a cap table that hopefully is situated and not, doesn't have a bunch of weird things in there. Yeah, don't, I'm having issues with cap table this week, so don't talk to me okay. about cap table. But we've literally gotten to the point, I have a couple startups where you know all my founders work for other companies. At Cozen O'Connor, we have a secure Dropbox site. We've just set it up for them. We're keeping all their documents in there. It's accessible to everybody. It's secure. It works. So a quick question about the IP. Sure. Be it patent or, the, or copyright. So if the molecule or the product hasn't been invented yet, mm -hmm. and I know there are two reaction mechanisms that can go to produce the same thing, say a molecule. Mm -hmm. Is it better to own the copyright or the patent to the product or to the pathway? We, we, in that case, we would patent as many things as we can. So you'd want to patent the molecule. You'd want to patent the molecule in a certain form. Can it be crystallized? Can, does it need to be amorphous? Does it need to be all of those kind of questions? We would patent how it works. So I would say you would take this, and it's important to take it um, you know, twice a day. It's important to take it only for treatment of this particular cancer. It's important to do this previous test because it only works with this type of patient that has this type of, uh, you know, a, a, a profile. So that's where you're going to sit down with me and we're really, you're going to give me a data dump on what do you have? Why do you have this? What data do you have that shows this? And we're going to go through the entire pathway uh, and really talk about it. I always like an IP a little bit too. I, I like to call it a, a a sphere or a box, and, and I kind of say, you can always patent things from one side, but when you have challengers, they're gonna come from every direction. It's not that helpful to just have this. So we would patent it from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, from here. When you have um, public, publicly traded drugs, they may have one patent. A lot of times they have dozens of patents um, that are gonna be to the molecule, to all variations, to extend a release, to slow release, to all those different profiles. So we're really going to, you're going to attack it from a lot of different directions. Okay. I think we have time for, you have a question? A couple more questions and we'll have to free up our honored speakers. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned uh, how to go about getting a business partner. And I guess my question is how to go in the opposite way. And I've heard like <laughs> things are trending towards, <laughs> oh. no, no, sorry, finding, uh, I've, I've heard that things are, trending towards favoring uh, at least partially technical founders. Uh, how, as like a not fully technical founder, do you go about finding somebody that can do the, oh, I see. the tech part? You're not, you saying, you're not saying to kick your other partner out. I, no, no. I, I, thought, you were, I thought you were talking business divorce. Yes. Business divorce is hard. It's hard. It's emotional. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I, I will tell you this. There's no perfect way of doing it. Um, one thing is, ask your advisors, find other people that are in that space and that are interested in that space and say, who do you know that does these things? Uh, go and ask, go and ask, find a Rolodex and go ask those questions. I, 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 I will say that you can find those advisors in dozens of different ways and the best starting point is to literally just ask people that have done a business like this, who they use, why they use them, how they got to them. There are specialty labs that could help you do that. The problem is, is you're going to pay those people, yeah. right? I think they're more, much more expensive. Right. You're looking for someone that you can say, I've got a great idea. I need a technical person who is part of my campus structure, yeah. maybe, to help me develop that. Um, ask, invite people to coffee. Yeah. Call, call Heather and say. Call, uh, call Jefferson yeah. Innovations and call they'll. Call the Innovation Pillar and yeah. say, you know, hey, this is this is a concept. I need help developing this. In fact. There are ways even to find dollars to help you do that and to do a little bit of lab space um, to help you develop those things. We can file for grants if this is something that's really exciting. So there are ways to help you develop that if and when you have that. Um, I will say again, you know, someone with a dynamic idea that is, um, you know, believes in the product and can sell that concept to us if we were the VCs. Um, I like that. I believe in you. I would believe in that product. Um, that's that's really powerful. So. Um, I, I'm okay having people that are non-technical. In fact, Silicon Valley, frankly, is full of people that don't actually code, 
They right. come up with these ideas. Well, the coding is, right. yeah. And I mean, we see a lot in the healthcare field because a lot of medical devices um, have software associated with it. So physicians are not necessarily writing code, but you can hire people to write code. You know what you want your dashboard to look like. You know what you want it to show. You know what the metrics are. You know what people are going to be looking for. And you can help scope that out. And that's important. I, I've had companies do this so many different ways. They hire folks in grad school. They hire folks in, you know, even some undergrads. Right, they to, pay them with equity. They, they can pay them with cash if they have a little bit of cash. A li yeah, it's usually a little bit of cash, and a lot of times it's just paid by the hour. But there are also shops that do this, and they are more expensive. Yeah. So if I can just add one interesting comment, I think, to your question. There is, you know about hackathons because you've been at Jefferson. So uh, there's now a hackathon at Oxford <laughs> in which as a sponsor, you can hire a team of four. They, they're all, and it's, it's all coding. <laughs> it's nothing but coding. So you, you can hire one of the teams as a sponsor. You give them your project. There's an exchange of CDAs. And by the end of the hack weekend, you potentially walk away with something very valuable. So there, there are variations of this theme getting developed all the time. And, and academe is, is really driving a lot of that. Final question, anybody? Anyone? Yeah? Oh, I'm Twitter. sorry. Oh, a Twitter question. All right, let's tweet away. Here, Anthony, you read it. So this question is, um, why do VCs prefer corporations over LLCs? What's the benefit to them, and why are they more investable? So corporations much of what is inherent in a corporation is set by law. You've got to have a board of directors. You're going to have officers. You will have articles and bylaws. What makes limited liability companies so great, but also creates a lot of variation, is they're completely creatures of contract. We can make the agreements for your limited liability company say almost anything. You can be member managed, you can be manager managed, you can have officers, you can have a board of directors, you don't have to. So VCs tend to like the clarity inherent in a corporation. They understand it. It's also the case that stock is a more easily transferable medium than membership interests. Nowadays, when we talk about exit strategies, in other words, the big payoff for everybody, we're not so much talking about initial public offerings, but it wasn't that long ago that that's kind of what everybody thought. Oh, we'll be a public company, and that's everybody's payday. And so that's still in the back of VC's mind as well. Also, most venture capital firms, beyond the initial stages, they want preferred stock. So preferred stock is an equity interest, but it gets a preferred return. And that's just what they used to. Most investors have a particular profile, and that's how they like to invest. And they're creatures of habit? Creatures of habit, yes. All right. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much Thank for you. spending Thanks your everybody. time with Thank us. You for Thanks, everyone, for coming. Another terrific presentation. Thank you, guys.